This conversation with Professor M. R. G. Conson, formerly Professor of Geography at the University of Newcastle, takes place in Birmingham a few months before his 80th birthday. Con, as he's universally known to his friends and colleagues, will be talking about the people and events that have influenced his life and writing with myself, Terry Slater, and my colleague, Jeremy Whitehand, uh, at the University of Birmingham. Con, I wonder if I could ask you, first of all, if you could tell me something about your early life and whether there was anything there um, that led you towards the study of geography. Well, in early life, of course, there could be no direct influence uh, uh, with regard to geography. A child is interested in everything uh, around him. Uh, but there were uh, certain factors in our family uh, that certainly uh, led me on in uh, a particular way ultimately to geography. One is that my father was a sculptor and uh, I inherited his propensity of his efficiency as a sculptor to see forms, shapes, colors, textures, and so on. And uh, this practiced at first, oh, quite unconsciously, um, has stayed with me for life. And what about your school days? Did your teachers help you to develop your geographical interests? Uh, in geography, not at all. And how did you know it was geography you wanted to study? Through the type of uh, textbooks, auxiliary books, uh, to help us with the uh, syllabus that we got in geography. I found them fascinating. And I usually, when we got such a book, uh, I was through that book long before we uh, the syllabus got through it in class. And I believe you had a particularly good history teacher as well. Uh, yes, that of course did not uh, directly influence uh, my interest in geography at the time, but it did one thing. It it brought a very a very uh, vivid picture of a subject to which otherwise I might not have been attracted at all. All the more so because I never had a good head for dates and figures. <laughs> Did you manage to get out into the countryside much from Berlin? We uh, frequently traveled to my grandparents in Thuringia, in the Thuringian forest. We, uh, I had not uh, thought of uh, geography naturally. And uh, I remember uh, going to East Prussia, or well, being sent to East Prussia after Hindenburg had uh, had his great victory over the Cossacks, <laughs> the Russian Cossacks at Tannenberg, and uh, I certainly was uh, very impressed as a boy of ten um, by the uh, Missourian lakes in the southern part of East Prussia. There was a lot of hiking and camping involved. From a certain age on, yes, certainly from the age of 14 because by then I had already joined uh, one of the uh, free youth movements that were such a characteristic feature of, the c of culture in the Weimar Republic. And through uh, being in the free youth movement, I had ample opportunity 
get to know the countryside, not only around Berlin, but all over Germany. Quite naturally, I connected everything that I saw with the interests I developed in geography. They were not specialized particularly. They were general at that time. Um, because the, the school had uh, encouraged us indirectly, never in any uh, formal way, that uh, in life it is best to look at all things around one, no matter how disparate they appear. Can you tell us a little bit about the department at Berlin when you got there? Uh, this, I think I'm not exaggerating if I say that it was one of the best departments in geography at that time. I came in Albrecht Banks last year. His lectures on geomorphology, well, absolutely irresistible. Wonderful, uh, wonderfully fresh in delivery and in the amount of stuff he was able to put over, needless to say, without lecture notes, <laughs> he uh, built up, uh, from the students' point of view, a wonderful department in which a form of teaching was practiced, uh, which I think was not only very characteristic of Central European academic teaching in geography, but uh, was in some ways undoubtedly uh, peculiar to Pink. What about field teaching? In a department led by Pink, it couldn't have been otherwise. But it was not only in physical geography. Throughout hu uh, human geography, the various branches of human geography as well. And in that way, I came in contact fairly soon with uh, the writings of Otto Schlüter, who was not in Berlin, but had been in Berlin long before me. While I had been at the uh, department in Berlin, perhaps for six months or so, when I discovered uh, Schlüter in the literature. He wrote some important, some fundamental papers to do with the, uh, the uh, conceptual organization of geography as an organized field of knowledge. And he had, to put it very briefly, uh, taking a leaf out of the um, physical geographer's uh, early successes and early progress in their, in their specialized subject. And uh, he wanted the advantages of field observation uh, to be used in cultural geography too. Was that something you got from Louis as well? He was another one of your teachers, I believe. Uh, yes, but uh, Louis had, uh, didn't influence me in cultural geography at all at that time. He wrote an important piece, uh, as you know, uh, about Berlin, in which he uh, developed the uh, concept of the uh, um, the uh, Stadtrandzone, the uh, urban fringe, or urban fringe belt. And uh, I took this over later, but uh, that came out in 1936, when I was already in England. 
What about Geisler? I believe he was one of uh, one of Schluter's yes. pupils in in Halle. Yes. Uh, I very soon got hold of Geisler's book on the German town, the Deutsche Stadt, and needless to say, leapt up the morphology as fast as I could read. <laughs> And uh, Geisler, uh, indeed, uh, my uh, undergraduate work was, um, oh, undoubtedly largely uh, uh, conditioned, or very much conditioned by what I learned in that literature from Halle, that emanated from Halle. So when I came to do my diploma dissertation in geography for the uh, school, uh, for school teaching, as a, for a preparation as a school teacher, uh, I just chose a subject in settlement geography. And did uh, a comparative study of oh, some 11 towns on the River Havel in the March of Brandenburg, uh, which is the country, the glacier country, around uh, Berlin, if you like. You notice a comparative study. This is also something which I think at that time was peculiarly Central European in method. One person you haven't mentioned is Hans Bobeck. Was he influential? Uh, yes, indirectly and probably without knowing it. Dr. Bobeck had taken a special excursion out to Brandenburg to do the urban geography according to uh, the methods that had emerged uh, in the literature so far. And I remember distinctly one of the uh, aspects dealt with were urban building types. Now, we uh, did these in small groups or singly, I forget now, uh, surveying by ourselves these building types. I had already, of course, read Geisler's Die Deutsche Stadt and we used his classification of building types at that time, I believe. And when we came back, we had to map the uh, individual work we had done. And from that, an overall map was done for the department, for the departmental manuscript map collection. Um, So in that way, uh, Dr. Bobek has uh, given me a, a particular impression of his ways of looking at towns, combining it with the literature, in this case Geisler, and uh, of course also other mm, non-morphological aspects of towns. Soon after you graduated from Berlin, circumstances were such that you chose to come to Britain. Could you tell us something of the circumstances as to how you came here? Oh, uh, I belonged to a, a 
a student organization, a free student organization that had moderate socialist leanings. Uh, our, the officers of our organization were raided by the SS or the SA, I don't know. And uh, I just came into the university one fine morning, the grapevine functioned, and I was informed that all the, uh, the, membership the membership records had been taken away. I went straight to the local police uh, where I lived, got my passport for study purposes to travel abroad. Uh, hitchhiked uh, in after two or three days to Hamburg, got uh, a small boat from the Baltic, Russian ship of all things. <laughs> so I was <laughs> far removed from communism. That took me to Hayes Wharf, London, where my future fiancé was already waiting. <laughs> <laughs> she too, needless to say, had been in the same movement. And what did you do for the first few years after you arrived in England? Uh, trying to keep alive. One was not allowed to, uh, it was a bad time, 1933. Uh, yes, that's right, 1933, when Hitler came to power. So uh, unemployment was rife in Britain. I remember very distinctly groups of miners singing and begging in the street in London. Uh, so we were there, refugees, no work permit, nothing. The first months were extremely hard. However, I did manage to teach post office girls German for their holiday requirements uh, and took cheap Green Line tickets out to uh, to the Chiltern Hills, Buckinghamshire, anywhere I thought it was interesting. How was it that you eventually took up a career in town planning? I went to the uh, International Students Service, ISS to ask them to help me to uh, complete my studies that had been interrupted in Berlin with a view to getting a qualification and then entering some professional career. They said, yes, we'll help you. Uh, what is your subject? Uh, geography. Oh, we have... Uh, um, a gentleman, a professor who, uh, of geography who is uh, very interested in refugees. We will get in touch with him and uh, find out whether there are any prospects, career prospects for you in geography. They uh, approached uh, this person of reference in geography, i.e. Professor Fleur, who uh, wrote back, uh, it's a great pity, but I can really not hold out any hope for the employment for a geographer, 1933. <laughs> um, because we have already far too many school teachers uh, unemployed 
including geography. I went on in the usual way of earning some pocket money. My fiancé, working as an au pair guest in private families, and we try to support ourselves in some way. Uh, when suddenly the ISS wrote and said, will you at once come to the office? There is news from Professor Fleur. And what had happened was that the, the professor of architecture are accordingly at the School of Architecture of, at Manchester University was just instituting the first diploma course in town and country planning at, uh, in England at any university. The first one. There were two students who entered and one of them was myself, the other one was an architect. And uh, I said, uh, of course, if it is town and country planning, it's certainly I <laughs> go. So that took you to Manchester? That took me to Manchester and uh, opened up uh, another professional field which uh, I have uh, found jolly useful. How did you transfer from town planning back to geography? Oh, Hitler helped me to that. He started a, a world war. <laughs> and I became overnight an enemy alien, formally. Having by then already, uh, this is 1940, having by then already uh, helped the uh, local authorities uh, in uh, Cheshire, where my town planning work was, through uh, to uh, get organized in civil defense, building shelters where they should be, etc until the uh, chief constable of uh, Cheshire got to know there is an actual enemy alien in charge of the uh, map work to be done. This was, was all done in, our in the town planning office, office of which I was chief assistant. And I was collected by the police and set the spouse three hours it must have been, together with a lot of other uh, enemy aliens that had been collected in Manchester. This was, uh, the, something must have happened, right? Were the Germans already at the, uh, at the channel? I'm not sure. Anyway, there was a reason for doing this uh, ad hoc uh, action. And the, uh, these enemy aliens, one by one, disappeared. As I knew later, they were all going to the internment camp near Liverpool. And I, my case didn't come up. What did come up was uh, a policeman uh, asking me, uh, they had uh, fetched me at six o'clock in the morning, so I had no breakfast two detectives, plainclothes detectives. Very charming men. Absolutely gentle. <laughs> but, uh, uh, oh, in fact, it, it was one of them, of these, who came back, uh, asked, what, what do you usually eat for, eat for breakfast? I said, well, I eat anything. Yes, but what do you like? Oh, I like tomatoes and I like bananas <laughs> and things like that. There came up bread and butter, 
tomatoes, bananas. I was taken into another room so that the, the others didn't have to watch me. My wife must have said something like, uh, don't worry, uh, after all, your application has already been in for some years. And they asked what the application is, says, and I said, well, it's a naturalization application. It's been going since 1935. And so they kept me waiting whilst they uh, telephoned uh, the home office. And the news came through. It was on the way. So at the beginning of the war, you found your way into the geography department in the University of Manchester. Yes, not directly. Uh, Fleur happened to know a crammer, cramming school for uh, weak pupils, right opposite uh, the geography department <laughs> on the other side of Oxford Street. And uh, he found me uh, some uh, some post, uh, temporary post, teaching geography. And in the meantime, his uh, own department became depleted because the uh, staff members, one by one, well, not one by one, almost in a fell swoop, were called up to naval intelligence for special war intelligence service. And uh, the employment situation at universities became a, a real item. Professor Fleur was able to uh, have the uh, university engage me on a temporary basis because of this peculiar war circumstances there. I took over the uh, map library and uh, did teaching in the cartography courses and gradually got into teaching that way, yeah, whilst at the same time, at the advice of Fleur, I prepared for an MA under him. Uh, that MA had already been planned during my town planning days. The MA came out, was finished, oh, I suppose, in 1942, I think. But during the war, certainly. Did Fleur have a strong influence upon that? Uh, no, not, not at all. He was not uh, the type of uh, person that uh, exerted uh, active strong influence from his side. We uh, would often have conversations on aspects of cultural geography as he understood it. And his approach uh, influenced me in a very general way, because he impressed me very much as, a, as an intellectual personality, with a wide range of knowledge, very integrated, which appealed extremely to anyone coming from Germany, having had a German education where the emphasis is on integrating seemingly disparate things that do hang together. And Fleur was such a man. At the end of the war, you came to move to Newcastle. How did that come about? I came formally to the end of my temporary three-year appointment. So I uh, applied to various places, and I suppose my planning background, though recent, 
relatively short, must have appealed to the professor in Newcastle. And uh, this was Professor Daesh, in fact, yeah. who uh, himself was interested in planning. Yes. Uh, did this then lead fairly naturally on to your participation some years later in the survey of Whitby in the mid-50s? Uh, yes, he, uh, he would expect me to take part. Uh, even though it wasn't a part he had particularly thought of, namely uh, uh, appreciation of the townscape as environment and therefore the relevant application of geography in planning the conservation side. You developed some very interesting ideas there ab about the about townscape conservation. And when one considers this was still the mid-1950s, this is quite early, isn't it, for such ideas to be well, developed? Well, uh, I think I would prefer to be modest. I think there were other people who thought of the uh, historical character as an asset, in your, especially in urban life, uh, at the time. Uh, if there was any difference or if I contributed anything special, well, it can only have been that I try and create a conceptual framework within which uh, more study in depth of the townscape can proceed. And from that evolve principles of conservation. Were you already beginning your studies of the town of Annick at the same time? Yes, in fact, uh, the work on Whitby, uh, which, uh, uh, which was not small, uh, there was a lot of work uh, involved. And uh, for me, it was an opportunity, of course, to get published. So I was particularly keen that I shouldn't lose that. And having the opportunity of uh, uh, putting my, my work down on uh, polychrome maps of unusually large size, uh, that meant that uh, we'd be pushed Annick on one side. I think I, I would have to consult my pocket diaries to get the chronology right. I came to Annick, which I knew already because Professor Daesh, in the very first week I arrived in Newcastle, took me in his car uh, over the whole of uh, Northumberland in a lightning tour, just to help me with uh, getting to know at least some part of the region in which I would spend my teaching life there. And uh, the, uh, we went up the, uh, the Great North Road, and Annick was on the plane. But uh, I had, of course, not nearly enough time. We went through Annick, I should say. <laughs> what particularly attracted you to go back there and make your detailed studies of it? Oh, undoubtedly, uh, that uh, as we came through uh, the uh, Hotspur Gate from the south, uh, the, the, the uh, street divided, and I said, by Jove, another one of these Anglian uh, village greens that has become the market. That is interesting, a triangular market. And as we um, whisked through, uh, leaving the triangle, that central triangle on one side, I desperately looked back into Fenkel Street. <laughs> 
And of course, that I've got it. This is for future program. Annick is easily your most cited work. Um, do you yourself see it as your most important contribution to geographical knowledge? Uh, well, I think I have to admit this, probably. It's not much. <laughs> but it is something. Yes, yes. It is, uh, it is, I... I'm sure it is important because it has opened uh, an avenue of thought and of ways of looking at the townscape, which I do believe uh, I have imported, <laughs> in a way. So this is, again, influence from your, your Berlin days, would you say? It goes right back to Otto Schlüter, 1905. 1909. Although I don't want to be misunderstood, uh, this is uh, what? Half a century later. It's interesting, isn't it, that Annick is referred to a lot, and yet very few people, if anyone, has sought to carry out a comparable town plan analysis. Yes. The answer is easy. It's far too much work for one person. You have to be dedicated. You have to be sure that uh, this is something nobody else has yet done. Somebody must do it. And it's for the others to pick it up and do likewise. I hope uh, in time, uh, the uh, Anik will have the influence that it should have from that point of view, simply to promote uh, organized intellectual work in this field, along those lines that one sees uh, seemingly static townscapes as something that has evolved and is evolving all the time. The, uh, the uh, conceptual framework has to be there to do this. For that, it is uh, not only necessary to squeeze uh, an individual case like Anik to the last drop for what it will give in conceptual contents, but to uh, to uh, start comparative study on a large scale. And that hasn't come yet. You developed a number of concepts in the Annex study. One of these was the Burgage cycle. What do you see as the significance of this particular concept? Uh, firstly, uh, that it has wide application. Annick being a medieval town, and Europe is full of medieval towns. I, I do think I'm right in saying that there are more medieval towns still extant, morphologically, than uh, post-medieval towns. Secondly, and it, this is perhaps in some ways more important, uh, it picks up a very significant developmental, evolutionary side of the townscape. I mean, in this case, change in, uh, in uh, the detail of plot pattern and change in the building fabric as a whole, as well as in terms of particular building types. Now that is, I suggest, a, a nearly universal uh, principle that 
has come out of this work as far as medieval towns with medieval burgage plots are concerned. So there are big uh, geographical differences, regional differences, depending on what are the uh, traditional medieval plot types. They are not the same over, over the whole of Europe. They change tremendously. Around the North Sea, we tend to have, certainly for the um, main ancient business centers of medieval towns, we tend to have long strip plots, what I would now call deep burgages. They don't occur everywhere in medieval Europe. So you see immediately one major point for future work. We must have comparative work in, uh, in uh, medieval plot types to find where, where can the Burgage cycle um, get its full head because uh, there are burgages long enough to provide for it. Well, in the presence of Terrace later, it's not <laughs> necessary to, to emphasize how important that point is. And indeed, he has made a start with comparative work. That's just it. Another idea that you developed was the fringe belt concept. How important in the development of that was the work that Louis did in Berlin in the 1930s? Oh, very much, very fundamentally, initially, uh, because I think he was the first one to take uh, a systematic uh, developmental, evolutionary approach to this phenomenon, to this geographical phenomenon. And uh, being a born Berliner like myself, he uh, had uh, a grand example. This was uh, a metropolitan agglomeration of altogether, I suppose, in its heyday, probably, well, six million for certain. Uh, in that case, it is extremely important to know how such a seemingly amorphous, big, when, uh, how it has, in fact, grown physically against time. Did it go gradually, bit by bit, without any particular principle in it? Or did it go a bit by leaps from one line to another? And he was, I think, the first one who who put this on paper for a very good example. I took, I, I took this concept, which uh, from my own experience, of course, I could see was eminently uh, real and did exist and at the same time was likely to be a pretty universal phenomenon that would occur elsewhere, therefore inviting once again a comparative study in order to, uh, to refine the concepts that uh, are grouped around the uh, urban French belt phen phenomenon. Yes, in, in that sense, uh, Louis's work was fundamental to my ideas of uh, the French bird concept. 
At the IGU Symposium in Urban Geography at Lund in 1960, Garrison criticised urban morphology for lack of its development of theory. Well, what's your reaction to, to his views? Well, he is right uh, if he talks about the English-speaking literature. No, there were, after all, attempts uh, besides myself. I don't think Garrison m might have known at that point when he spoke anything about uh, my work, <laughs> although we were in the same symposium. <laughs> he will presumably have heard the, the Central Newcastle paper, which was in many ways a follow-up to the Adam I study. have no idea, uh, but the paper was um, given uh, very inefficiently by its author. <laughs> so I, I would forgive uh, Garrison if he <laughs> formed his opinion on that. Another town that's provided one of your case studies is Ludlow. How did you come to first go there? And when did you begin to carry out your own survey of the townscape? I got to know uh, Ludlow physically for the first time uh, when hiking and camping with my wife in the Welsh border. <laughs> uh, fell in love with the uh, town scape and knew, ah, here is another thing, a key town. I had got the uh, uh, a town plan uh, on some map and looking at it, uh, I found it already very exciting. I mean, knowing nothing about Ludlow, I could say, oh yes, here's stage one, the market. Stage two, possibly this uh, clearly planned town that cannot be other than 13th century. Uh, there is a feature, Old Street, Corf Street, that looks ancient in, in general layout, but it's also full of houses. I wonder where that fits in, uh, in time. Anyway, uh, the uh, the plan is so obviously composite and has so strong, such strong uh, contrasts in its plan, in its town plan, that uh, one has to investigate this. One never knows what comes out of it. It's interesting that four of the towns you have written about have been defended with town walls. Was that an accident, or are you particularly attracted to them as a, as a European-wide feature? Well, I will admit uh, they, uh, it is attractive because, it's, you know, of course, a uh, fringe belt is involved <laughs> straight away. <laughs> you see, you could, uh, could you imagine any more powerful uh, fringe belt as far as uh, accessory con uh, contrasts are concerned than a town wall? Uh, so, uh, y yes, but, uh, but I picked up these uh, examples that turned out to be, uh, in my experience, key examples for furthering thinking, furthering conceptual thinking about the townscape. I picked them up at random, just as life went on. Yes. But they're more useful than the typical one-street English market town with no defences. Yes, that is why where I met such, uh, such towns, uh, one would do fraudulent. <laughs> if we could turn now to your ideas on townscape management, to what extent were these influenced by the ideas of philosophers? I'm, to be quite honest, I'm not sure that I've read enough about relevant philosophy, to be, be very clear about this. When, 
when you understand or begin to understand the development uh, of anything that is susceptible to geographical observation in the field, then uh, the, uh, the object becomes more interesting. You uh, start to think of its implications, and one of them is the social implication on a living society that uses this cultural landscape uh, as its habitat, its daily habitat. And this does not hang together with philosophy only. There are other strands as well. But if I could ask you a technical question, you emphasize the role of morphological regions in townscape management. To what extent do you feel that the delimitation of these regions is a subjective process? Uh, it is uh, subjective uh, only uh, if you have no appropriate conceptual framework to help you with making it objective. Uh, it is actually a very old question in geography. How do we define boundaries of uh, units in geography? Some define them by intensity and special character of contents of the region. Others try to define them by boundary lines. Uh, as regards the last one, boundary, boundary lines, both in physical geography as well as in human geography, have a, a disconcerting tendency to dissolve when you come down to detail, more and more detail. The point could be made, uh, for instance, in taking, uh, uh, could be made clear, this point I've just made, could be made clear in taking what so far I see as the smallest uh, unit, morphological regional unit in uh, towns, in the townscape, the morphotope. The morphotope uh, is determined in its existence, in its reality, and in its uh, character of a unit, a spatial unit, by a number of criteria that lie in the actual forms that we can see or observe. So far, my experience uh, seems to indicate that the building fabric has a peculiarly important, uh, pe peculiar import in this. The distribution pattern of historical building types, urban building types, especially when they range over uh, a wide historic time span, say from the Middle Ages, this is a common beginning for most European towns, to the present day. You have the to start with, we, you have a major dichotomy, cutting this time span into two branches, an early and a late. The early one, in terms of building fabric, is, I think, best. At any rate, it is uh, by, uh, by architectural consent 
known in, in English as the uh, traditional, the period of traditional building types, as against non-traditional building types. The uh, dividing line in time is about 1830 in England. It's a convenient date. You realize this date is bound to be conventional. It's a conventional date and is liable to change in detail as soon as you come down to a particular example, regional example. So that the, the mix, the mixture of building types in any one locality, in any top, topos, uh, can change very much. In the, this is why why I think the uh, smallest local mix makes sure that individuality of the local mixture as an area unit, as a geographical unit, uh, is, uh, becomes clarified. If you go down Corf Street in Ludlow, which we have mentioned before, I'm sure I could point out where one morphotope ends and another <laughs> uh, starts. But it is not quite so simple as you think. Even there, a conventional, some conventional element comes in. Namely, the principles, the mechanical principles by which you define a boundary in such a hair-raisingly difficult pattern. Looking at the immediate future, say the next decade, what do you see as being the most pressing need in urban morphological research? To strengthen interdisciplinary cooperation in relevant uh, subjects and to thereby to create the widest basis, the widest geographical basis. Oh, yes, not only um, in uh, interdisciplinary cooperation, but international cooperation. I can only be a, an urban morphologist by uh, reading, oh, perhaps six European languages, or at least my, my own liter literature, my uh, professional literature in that. That's nothing against some colleagues that I know. But uh, we need that, uh, that interdisciplinary, besides the interdisciplinary cooperation, we need international cooperation. In that way, we can create an ultimately universal frame of reference for comparative study. Because a comparative study in a subject or in subjects like geography or history, for that matter, is indispensable for the uh, development and furtherance of conceptual thinking in that field. You, uh, you are the ideal researcher if in every individual case you can see both the individual as well as the uh, general. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Conswin. This conversation has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sharing some of your life experience with us and talking about your work and research. We hope this film will allow others to share in our own pleasure in knowing you and to share some of the inspiration that your thoughts and writings have given to both of us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>